thank you all uh, for being here, and thank you uh, to the organizers. <clears throat> so we've talked a little bit about um, innovation uh, so far. We've talked about technological innovation. We've talked a little bit about regulatory innovation. Um, I want to talk about this uh, evolution and the efforts by governments to finance innovation in the uh, energy space. Um, obviously, the energy space has implications not only for energy, um, but also for environmental concerns, um, climate change concerns. And so the ability of the international economic system to grapple with the ways in which governments are trying to creatively sponsor private sector innovations in the energy space um, are, uh, are incredibly important. Um, and I want to focus today a little bit on how this is playing out um, before the World Trade Organization specifically between India and the United States. It's, an, it's a nice topic for this conference, I think, because India and the United States are in a um, reciprocal dispute before the uh, WTO. Um, it's worth mentioning, I think, that uh, the world's five largest economies by nominal GDP are the US, the EU, uh, China, Japan, and India. Uh, it looked for a while as if there was going to be some regulatory innovation in the form of new, what in the United States we refer to as mega regional trade agreements that were going to unite, start uniting these five economies um, in comprehensive economic agreements outside of the WTO. So TPP would have included both the United States and Japan. TTIP would have included the United States and the, uh, and the EU. Um, the idea, of course, I think, with TPP was to expand further into Asia. Um, and although we're guessing a little bit, it appears that uh, neither TPP nor TTIP is likely to uh, go forward in the future, at least with the United States as a um, participant. Um, India and China are in discussions um, as part of the RCEP, so it's possible that that will be the first uh, really mega regional agreement to include two of these, um, of these big five. But until we start to see those uh, agreements come online, we are basically left with WTO rules as the place in which we're going to sort out the ability of governments to uh, creatively use domestic policy to advance uh, objectives and to what extent the uh, trade rules are going to restrict um, are going to restrict that. So I want to give you a little bit of background about the dispute uh, between the, unit, the U.S. and India. Um, basically, the uh, national solar mission here in uh, India uh, provides uh, government support for uh, renewable energy, and it contains a feature that is common to lots of other renewable energy programs around the world, which is called a local content requirement or sometimes a domestic content requirement. And the, the details vary de from depending on which specific program you're talking about. But basically what happens is rather than simply providing a production subsidy to a company that makes, for example, solar panels, what you do is you agree to pay a premium to an electricity producer conditioned on their use of locally produced uh, solar cells. Um, and that's a local content requirement. And it's pretty clear that you're not allowed to do that under WTO rules. So uh, the first case involving solar um, technology or renewable technology to hold this actually was in 2013. It was a case that the EU and Canada uh, excuse me, the EU and Japan brought against Canada. Um, they won that case. Um, the United States, uh, shortly thereafter, proceeded against India. Um, and on September 16th of this year, India uh, lost the case. The appellate body found, uh, upheld the panel's determination that uh, the, um, the measure violated the uh, GATT and an agreement called the TRIMS agreement and was not justified under, um, uh, under some exceptions that potentially could have excused India's violation. So September 16th was a Friday. On Monday, September 19th, India filed a case against the United States that challenged certain state and local measures in the United States. I think, I, if I remember correctly, it was eight uh, measures that were challenged. Um, six of them were state measures. Two of them, I think, were city measures uh, from, from Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, these measures contain basically the same requirement. Um, and India had signaled very far in advance that if the United States pursued this challenge against India, that India would, would proceed against the United States. Um, as a feature of our federal system in the United States, there's actually very little the United States can do to actually correct the actions of our uh, state and local governments. So it's actually quite an uncomfortable position for the US uh, federal government to be in. Um, for reasons that are not entirely clear, this did not persuade uh, the United States Trade Representative's Office to moderate its position. 
uh, in, the, uh, in the India dispute. Um, so it's, uh, it's worth noting that um, these two disputes are two of only about 18 renewable energy disputes, that, trade disputes, that have come up since uh, t about 2009. Um, now, not all these disputes have actually made it to the WTO. Some of them are what we call trade remedy disputes that could, in theory, make it to the WTO but have not uh, done so yet. They're subject to WTO um, disciplines, though. Um, these two disputes are, are interesting to focus on because we are here uh, in India, though, and because they involve these, um, these non-discrimination rules. Um, now, um, somehow this is, uh, there we go. Um, so there's a question about how often we see um, discrimination uh, occurring in connection with uh, green technology and in particular with renewable energy technology. A recent study found that, or two recent studies actually, found that there were about 20 renewable energy local content requirements uh, at, that occur at the national level globally. Um, and I conducted a research um, program about uh, two years ago uh, that found, my suspicion was that this was wildly under-inclusive, that this number was wildly under-inclusive. And that's basically what I found. So in the United States, uh, we have about half of our states, um, so we have 50 states, 23 of them have uh, programs just in the renewable energy space that contain these local content rules that uh, would, I think, um, sort of prima facie violate WTO rules. Now, there's various reasons that some of them might ultimately end up being excused, but um, this is a pretty significant uh, finding that once you move beyond simply looking at the national level, you see many, many more of these things. Um, this is particularly important because when you think about uh, many of the world's largest economies, many of the world's largest economies are in fact federal systems. So India uh, has a federal structure, Brazil has a federal structure. Um, within NAFTA, all three NAFTA parties um, are, federal, uh, are federal states. The EU, if you think of the EU as a single entity, is a federal um, structure or a, at least a confederal structure. So these, these federations and the ability of these um, subsidiary governments to implement policies that are uh, inconsistent with WTO rules where they may not, um, for reasons having to do with the way liability works in international regimes, they may not be particularly worried about it, um, is something that we, uh, we have to take into account. I mean, these local programs, these local uh, governments are trying to innovate to finance uh, the development of new technology, and they are really potentially running into fairly significant handicaps. Um, just at the bottom here, this was a, a not very scientific estimate of what these U.S. programs um, were worth, about a billion dollars a year. If you, I, I sampled about a quarter of these programs and then, and then just extrapolated. Um, just to tell you a little bit um, about where, uh, where I'm going with this, argument, I basically think that we need to rethink the way these non-discrimination rules are applied to uh, innovative technologies that are designed to address particularly environmental problems, um, global, global public goods. Um, the WTO has um, two non-discrimination rules as a general matter. One is most, the most favored nation rule, which says you can't discriminate among countries. And the other is the national treatment rule, which says that you cannot discriminate against foreign um, products um, or services. Um, I just want to skip uh, a slide for uh, a moment just to, to explore the underlying rationale. So there's, there's an economic and a political logic to uh, non-discrimination rules. The economic logic is, is fairly straightforward, which is that if you discriminate against uh, foreign products, that is essentially arbitrary. It has nothing to do with the quality of the products at all. And so you are denying um, both your own domestic consumers and foreign producers the ability to capture gains from trade. So this is a fairly straightforward argument about not negating comparative advantage through uh, discrimination behind um, the border. But there's also a really important political logic to non-discrimination rules. And the political logic is that um, the WTO, for the most part, with, with uh, the exception of some of these uh, SPS measures, these newer disciplines in the WTO, by and large, uh, the WTO, and, and in particular the GATT, doesn't really worry too much about what happens behind the border so long as you are not discriminating. And what that means is that governments have a lot of leeway to do all kinds of things that make no sense whatsoever, as long as they do it in a non-discriminatory fashion. And the break on governments from doing things that are completely silly and ridiculous 
is that the domestic producers will stand up and exercise their political rights and say, please don't do this, this is a terrible, terrible idea, and that will then protect the foreign producers because they get the same treatment. So the non-discrimination rule provides a form of essentially proxy representation to foreign producers, which is especially important when you're talking about very large markets like India and the United States, where um, there's this incentive that our governments have to protect domestic producers, but foreign producers have and, have, and their governments have bargained for market access rights um, that can be negated by, um, by discrimination. Now, I, I want to go back here and just talk about the way in which uh, these non-discrimination rule, non rules work. So the, the basic idea is that if you violate the non-discrimination rule, you will suffer um, penalties. The WTO appellate body will find you, or the dispute settlement body will find you to be in violation. You then face potential retaliation. And there's sort of an internalization logic here. You should therefore only discriminate when the gains exceed, the gains to you exceed the losses that your discrimination imposes on everybody else. The problem with this is that this breaks down, and this is the, the ultimate point of this paper, is that this breaks down when you are talking about um, discrimination that produces public goods of some kind that are not captured by the market. Um, and trade rules basically don't have the ability to account for this, and my argument is that that is a fairly significant problem. Um, and India, actually, in the India solar cells dispute, was, I think, quite creative in trying to think about how you might justify this uh, in trade rules. They were, unfortunately, ultimately unsuccessful. Um, but I think the search for ways to uh, f justify discrimination that ultimately is beneficial because it serves um, potentially what we might think of as non-trade purposes uh, is not going to go away and is likely, given the uh, trends we've seen in the United States, um, in terms of pulling out of some of these negotiations is likely to accelerate and we're likely to see it pr pursued as a uh, dispute resolution. We're basically like to, likely to see um, tribunals having to sort of sort out how this works because international negotiations do not appear to be moving at a pace that is going to allow a negotiated resolution uh, in, the, um, in the near term. Um, so uh, there are at least two problems that are uh, there we go, that are, that are created by um, the, this, uh, this application of non-discrimination rules to renewable energy support programs. The first problem and, um, that is worth mentioning, and I've got a, a, another paper about this, has to do with selective enforcement of the rules. And so we talked a little bit yesterday, um, particularly with Elizabeth's paper, about the notion of regulatory innovation and the role that capture by industries can play. Well. Um, Trade rules basically work like a system of private enforcement, where countries privately enforce their rights in a decentralized fashion through the dispute resolution system that's set up by the World Trade Organization. The result of that is that they don't tend to bring disputes because they have public policy concerns. They tend to bring disputes because they uh, are, have some interested group that wants them to bring a um, dispute. Um, what this is, the effect this has had in the energy context is that we only see disputes about government support for renewable energy, and we do not see disputes about government support for fossil fuel industries, even though the two compete in the market, and even though government support for fossil fuels is vastly larger than government support for um, renewable energy. So this is a significant distortion of the market that emerges through uh, the selective enforcement of these rules. The second thing, uh, as I mentioned, um, and in the interest of time I won't dwell on this uh, further, is just that these non-discrimination rules do not require the full internalization of costs and benefits. They really only focus on um, the uh, trade-related costs and benefits. Now, um, the reason, the justification for allowing additional discrimination uh, where it's tied to these environmental objectives is essentially a political economy argument about the advantages of um, discrimination. So what discrimination, the political logic of uh, non-discrimination is that it, it basically links the fortunes of foreign and domestic um, producers. If you are allowed to discriminate, what you are allowed to do is you are essentially allowed to shift costs to parties that are outside of the political system. So it essentially allows you to remove a break on um, the domestic political process. Now normally we think this is a bad thing, but um, and, and in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of uh, speed through this. But the basic uh, point is that 
there are some jurisdictions where this is going to be beneficial when we have reason to think that the discrimination is creating essentially non-monetizable benefits. Um, and this is going to occur when you have um, uh, smaller um, jurisdictions, either in financial or geographic terms. Um, and I think what this means is when you're talking about basically local governments or when you're talking about emerging markets. Um, if you think about what happens in a legislature, a legislature has a certain amount of money that it can allocate to whoever it is that's lobbying it for, um, for aid. And um, it's contentious how to allocate scarce resources, and it becomes increasingly more contentious the scarcer those resources are. The effect of this is that you are allowed, uh, is that there's pressure on legislators or administrative agencies, whoever's doing the carving up of the pie, to try to spend uh, a single dollar or a rupee multiple times, right? And so that's what a local content requirement does. It, in most cases, it would be totally fine to simply give a production subsidy to a producer of solar panels, okay? That would, there, it could be a problem, but for the most part, that's actually really difficult to challenge under, um, under WTO rules, and it, you, it would not be challengeable under these non-discrimination rules. Um, instead, though, what, they, what these uh, governments want to do is they want to actually give the dollar to two different entities. They want to give it first to the uh, utility company, usually, that's generating the power, and then they want the utility company to pass it on to the domestic producer. Because then, if you think about it from a political economy standpoint, you get two groups that are supporting the passage of this program. And the basic argument is, that's, we normally think that this is a bad thing because it distorts the second market, right? It distorts the market for solar panels because you're no longer choosing the most cost-effective solar panel. And that's right in a static sense, but in a dynamic sense, what it does is it allows the government to pass the program, which allows them to invest in innovation and in technology that's creating non-market benefits, and those investments would not necessarily be possible in the absence of the local content requirement. So the discrimination, although it's creating costs for trade, it's trade restrictive, it is creating these non-market um, non benefits. Um, so I'm being given the, the hook here. So um, um, just to conclude, the, ba the basic idea here is that uh, I think trade, trade rules are going to have to evolve in how they think about the role of discrimination for emerging markets, uh, and for local governments. Um, there has to be some recognition, and we've heard this at a number of points. We heard this from Danielle Gervais this morning. Uh, Michael Barr mentioned this in the context of regulation, that um, we really start need to think about heterogeneity and how we regulate um, governments and their, the, the role that domestic governments themselves play uh, in regulating um, companies and markets. The trade regime is not, I think, um, has not adapted very quickly to that, and I think there's going to be enormous pressure on it to do so in the future, and I think a lot of that pressure is coming from these disputes that um, have India and, and China at the heart. So, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tim.